So when people hear about risk management, you know, they get scared. But if you develop a risk management plan for your Master Gardener program, it prepares you for those unexpected circumstances. When things happen, you know exactly how you'll address those risks. So what I'll do today is share Muted by hosts. Okay. All right. So how much of that did y'all hear? Because I saw I was muted by the host. Okay, I'll Norma, keep going. <laughs> yeah, Norma, go ahead and just repeat the last part. We heard the beginning, um, but I was just checking um, to make sure folks were muted as they were calling in. So go ahead and just repeat the last part. Okay, so what I was saying is that, you know, people get terrified by the term risk management. And so having a risk management plan for your Master Gardener program prepares you for those unexpected circumstances that may happen. And so you'll know exactly how to react when something happens in your program. So what we'll do, I'll give you some background information on my Master Gardener program. I've been a Master Gardener Coordinator here in Marion County, Florida since 2008. We'll talk about some risk for um, definition, some types of risk, risk management strategies, and I'll give you some background into how we developed our plan and the risks that we came up with and the strategies for mitigating those risks and then I'll take some questions. So we'll run through quite a bit. Okay, so our Master Gardener program is a registered 501c3. And when I started in 2008, it was already registered. So that was not something that's done by me. But what we do, we try and make sure that we follow our protocol for running our program using the Florida guidelines for nonprofit organizations. Of course, each of you have a vision and mission for your Master Gardener program. So this is the mission and purpose of our Master Gardener program. And so it's important that as an organization, that your Master Gardeners are familiar with the vision and mission of your organization so that there's no mission drift. And so we'll talk about mission drift being a risk um, later on. These are the nine values that our program hold daily and they're based on what we call the Florida friendly landscaping principles. So right plant, right place, water conservation, fertilizing appropriately, use of mulch, attracting wildlife, managing yard pests responsibly, recycling yard waste, reducing storm water runoff and protecting the waterfront. So whatever educational programs we deliver in the community, we incorporate one or all of those um, in whatever we're teaching. So our current board, um, we have a president, a vice president, a secretary, and a treasurer. We have directors for each of the programs. And I run my Master Gardener program just as you would a business. And so my master gardeners have the ability to make decisions related to the areas of operation. So we have an operations director who's in charge of the plant clinic. We have a membership chair who calls up those members to remind them that they need to enter their hours or they're lagging behind. We have a spring festival chair we have um, an educational outreach chair, demonstration garden, um, marketing and special project chair, propagation, youth, and we have a representative from, the, um, from each new class. So I have listed here some of the programs that we do. So we have a plant clinic and we see about 4,500 customers um, each year in our plant clinic, either through calls or through walk-ins. Um, educational outreach, that's um, our speakers bureau where we go out and do talk in the community. We also have a spring festival where we usually have about 8,000 to 8,500 
residents visit our two-day event, which is always held the second weekend of March. We have a vegetable garden expo in the fall, which is a four-hour event where we bring people in to teach them about, you know, growing their own food. We have two plant sales and we have demonstration gardens. And so with all these activities that we do, there are risks associated with these activities. So I'm sure each of you have lots of um, activities within your program. And so it's good for you to know the risks that are associated with those activities. So when you try to define risk, there are lots of different definitions and schools of thought out there on how risk is defined. And so I've chosen three general definitions here for you. So a risk is a measure of the possibility that the future may be surprisingly different from what we expect. So you may have things planned out, but something surprising may happen that you didn't plan for. Risk is the extent, which is the direction. So direction can be positive and negative. So risk isn't all bad all the time. It can be positive or negative. The probability, which is the likelihood of it occurring, and the magnitude, the severity, to which the future differs from our expectations. And then the last definition is the risk is a combination of the probability of an event and its consequences. So if, when you're developing a risk management plan, there are three questions that a nonprofit, or even if your organization is a nonprofit, your master gardener program should think about what can go wrong and believe me things will go wrong so it's forecasting what can possibly go wrong and if something goes wrong what will your nonprofit or your master gardener program will do to address that situation and then of course if that event does go wrong um, how will your nonprofit pay for it so what is in place to handle that situation when it happens. So these are some questions to think about in developing a plan for your Master Gardener program. So in looking at your program and assessing the risk, the risk can fall into three categories, governance, administrative, and operational, and we'll go through um, each of these. So governance related risk are the behind the scenes risk, and these can be broken down into several areas. So conflict of interest, liability, mission risk, and reputation risk. So those are things that are from the board perspective, and I'm sure each of you probably have a Master Gardener board. So these all relate to governance. And then the, the administrative risk, which also involve the leaders of the organization, as well as the staff and the volunteers. And these are listed here, management error or incompetence, recruitment and training, um, compensation, promotion and disciplinary action. And that probably um, wouldn't apply to your nonprofit or your master gardener program because you probably don't employ anyone. Um, civil rights related issues, termination, and a lot of people think you can't terminate volunteers, but hopefully um, that's something that you all utilize in your program and the risk associated with that. Um, personal policies and implementation, workplace related issues, and volunteer turnover. So all those are administrative risk. And then there the operational risk that covers employees, um, clientele, and third parties. And so these risks include sexual harassment, occupational safety and health hazards, um, American Disabilities Act related risks, clients, vicarious liability, which is the risk for being held liable for third party um, or contractor, volunteers, and injury in the workplace. So those are your operational risk. So it, when you're looking at 
all the possible activities that your organization does and the risk associated with those activities, you can group those risks into what we call a risk probability chart. So this particular um, graph that you're seeing here is by Mind Tools. And there's another version um, by, you know, there's other versions out there where they actually use a quadrant that you can put the risk in. So on the y-axis, you have the probability of occurrence. So what's the likelihood of a risk occurring? So it ranges from low to high. And then on the x-axis, you have the impact of the risk or the severity of the risk. And that also ranges from low to high. So critical risk are the things that are high impact, high probability, or you hear some people refer to those as high um, risk and you have medium level risk which are those in between so as you develop a risk management plan you want to have something in place at least for those risks that are classified as high risk or medium level risk so those are the things that are crucial um, to your organization so what are the strategies for managing these risks that you've probably identified so once you've considered those risks, you need to make a plan for how your organization is going to manage those risks. So the first is avoidance. So you can totally ban the activity because there are risks associated with it. And everything we do in life, there are risks. So you, you know, if you're one that have a low appetite for risk, then you'll probably say, no, we won't do that. No, we won't do that. And you avoid doing everything because you don't want to deal with it. So um, for us, an activity that we have banned in our Master Gardener program is Master Gardeners using chainsaws. So no use of chainsaws by our Master Gardeners. Modification is change the activity to alleviate the risk and an example is that our demonstration gardens, whenever the temperatures are like in the high 90s with a heat index into the hundreds, we usually cancel the activity um, on that particular day or they come in you know, very early in the morning and leave early. So that's how we modify um, that activity to deal with that risk of heat stroke. Then retention is that you accept all or parts of the risk. So we realize, okay, master gardeners are going to be working out in the heat. There's possibility of heat stroke. And so we retain that risk. And so we provide our master gardeners with water and Gatorade. So while they're there working, they have access to that. Um, and then sharing which is transfer part of the risk to another organization. And so if we have a tree that needs cutting down, we pass that risk on to a third party. So they will um, share the risk. And then abatement, which is suspend or postpone risky activities. And that's where we cancel our work in the, in the demonstration gardens, for example, if it's too cold or if, um, or if it's too hot. So the next slide is the risk management process. And so this is just a, you know, a graphic to show you the steps involved in the process. So the first thing is to identify and analyze the exposures or risks. So looking at your, your program and deciding all the activities and the risk associated with those activities. Then examining the risk management techniques or the strategies, which is what I spoke of on the previous slide. And one thing I forgot to mention on this slide is that you can utilize more than one strategy for an activity. So you don't have to use just one. So you can have modification and retention as a, you know, as a strategy for dealing with heat stroke, for example, um, for master gardeners working in your garden. And then select risk management technique. Um, and then 
after you select the technique that you're going to use, then you implement the technique. So you decide, here's what we're going to do to mitigate that risk. And then you monitor for results and the cycle, um, you know, repeats itself. So I'll tell you how we went about developing our plan. So what I did is that I notified administration, um, both at the county level and at the university level, that I was planning to put together a risk management plan for Master Gardener program. And I am very happy that I did that at the front end because at the end of it all, um, when I got to the point where I contacted university risk management to let them know I had these questions, they then called um, my district director to find out, do you know that you have a master gardener coordinator who's developing a risk management plan? So it was a good thing I had notified my um, district director um, up front. So I start a lot to do a lot of digging in the literature on Journal of Extension and whatnot at the time to see if there was anything in terms of risk management um, for Master Gardener programs. And this was back in 2011. I couldn't find anything. I also sent out, um, sent out an email through the state master gardener coordinator to the coordinators in Florida to find out if anyone had done a risk management plan. And there wasn't any information there either. So I was, you know, in new territory, if you want to call it that. So I sent out a message to my master gardeners and also spoke with them at one of our monthly meetings to let them know that I was going to do this um, risk management plan. And I needed the input to see what concerns that they had that they think are risks that we need to work on. And I got quite a bit of feedback from the membership. Then I um, asked for volunteers to sit in a focus group session. And so I had two board members and three of the membership sat with me for four hours and we work on, you know, listing all the activities and the risk associated with each activity. And then we categorize them based on if they're governance, administrative, or, or um, operational related risk. Then once we were going through that process, we had quite a bit of questions that I didn't have the answers to. So I contacted the county risk management person and the university risk management um, person to answer those questions for us. And so the county risk, manage, risk manager, since it's a county property, um, he agreed that he would come and do a walkthrough of the property with me in the areas that are most utilized by the master gardeners, where we can look at different things um, that might be of concern. And then once we got all that, we looked at strat how, what strategies we were going to use to mitigate the different risks. So what I'll do now, I'll go through the different risks that we identified for the program and, um, and what we came up with for each of those, for each of those risks that are, we considered high impact, high probability, or medium impact, medium probability. So for governance-related risks, we came up with those that are high risk of fraud, reputation, deviation from the mission or mission drift, and medium would be um, wrongful dismissal and claim of payment not made, and low risk um, spending over budget and volunteer records. And so I'll go through some of these with you. So for fraud, um, in your Master Gardener program, of course, you're handling money. And so we wanted to look to see, you know, how we fall within these. So there's a tool called the Volunteer Legal at Risk Test, and it's a tool by the Nonprofit Risk Management Center. 
and there's a fee in order to utilize that tool. And so to determine risk tolerance, an entity needs to look at outcome measures of its key objectives. So for us, of course, we want to generate revenue to run our Master Gardener program. Customer satisfaction is important to us. And we have to consider the range of outcomes above and below the target that would be acceptable. So for example, if our target for customer satisfaction rating is 90%, we may tolerate outcomes between 88 and 95%. And so this would mean that we have an appetite for risk that could put our performance um, below a level of, we do not have an appetite for risk that would put our performance below 88%. So we wanna make sure that we are performing at a high level. Then the risk appetite, the amount and type of risk the organization is willing to accept in pursuit of its objectives. So that's just some definitions there. So when you look at fraud in our organization, um, we develop an annual budget and we have an audit committee that looks at our, our books every year and we file our taxes and we have a high level of confidence in our board members. And so um, even though fraud is a possibility of happening, we thought that we have some measures in place that you know, we're doing well. So this is a risk, of course, that any organization would want to retain. So the procedures currently in place, we felt that they were satisfactory. However, we, rec um, we recommended budgeting and auditing policies to make sure that we're following best practices. So we, we needed to improve upon what we were currently doing. Then of course, reputation. And we spend years building our reputation in the community. And so when you talk about Marion County Master Gardeners, you, you know, people will say a lot of good things about us, you know, near and far. However, if we have one bad, you know, thing happen to us that can cause harm to our reputation, then all those years of hard work goes down the drain. And so it's important that we work to, you know, keep our reputation strong within the community. So um, when you look at um, risk appetite, we will lose public support confidence and we would even lose funding. And depending on what the situation is, we could also have the possibility of the county and the university dissolving the program. So then it's important that through governance, we train the new members of the board that are coming in so they know what the bylaws of the organization are. And we also do that for the members, but to get them familiarized with their, their positions so that they know what is, it, what is expected. Um, there's also, there also needs to be clear guidelines for how you're going to address media issues. And so you don't want your master gardeners to be talking to the media when you know something terrible happens. So my master gardeners know if there's a controversial issue that needs to be addressed, it's either myself or the county public relations officer who handles that particular issue. Because if they say something wrong, then you know that's not gonna be a good thing. So modification would be the strategy to address that. Then of course there's mission drift. And so, you know, you hear some people talk about their master gardener programs being run like garden clubs. And evidently it's a situation where, you know, they've lost sight of the vision and mission of their organization. So for us, we have regular discussion at our board meetings on whether or not certain activities help us to achieve the mission of the organization. And we have a high level of confidence in that. And we continually evaluate our programs to make sure 
that we are in compliance with the mission of the organization. And so modification is a strategy for, for dealing with this. Now let's talk about the administrative related risk. And so you see here, we have damage to reputation again and financial fraud. So you can have some of these risks repeating themselves under, um, under the different areas of, of risk. Then you have personal liability, um, failure to record volunteers on site, failure to properly train master gardeners. Um, low risk would be harm caused by contracted workers embezzlement of funds, loss of files, and misuse of restricted funds. So those are some things that, you know, we came up with. I already went through reputation and financial. The only thing I would say on financial is that our, our level of control when it came to counting money was, was in need of improvement. So even though we had confidence in, in our treasurer and you know, whenever we collected money, the treasurer would get that money and then you know, take the money, count it up and take it to the bank. Well, what we've done since we've implemented the risk management plan is that we have several people counting and recounting the money so that there's not just one person you know, in charge of, of the money. When we, when we collect that money for plant sales. And then we also put checks and balances in place for when the um, bank statements come in, we have a master gardener who looks at those bank statements before it goes, that, goes to the treasurer. So um, there's that. And then um, liability. So of course, each of you have a volunteer screening process. And this is a high impact, low probability risk if you're doing it correctly. Um, loss of reputation and potential for bankruptcy from high legal costs. And luckily for us, you know, the university and county covers us with some of these things. Um, and so purchasing liability insurance might be necessary for some nonprofits, but for us, um, through our Master Gardener program, the university and the county covers us um, with liability insurance and providing legal advice. So in that case, we are sharing um, this risk with the university and the county. Failure to properly train MGs, and hopefully all of us are doing intensive training for the Master Gardeners when they come in at first. And so there's a potential for master gardeners to give wrong advice to a client, but hopefully, you know, that isn't happening. They're telling people, you know, I don't know the answer. I'll get back with you. Um, and so it's one that we accept and we modify. And so we use frequent training, um, pre and post tests on continuing education so we are constantly um, updating the master gardeners. Then there's those operational related risk. And this is where you see we have lots of things in each one of the, in each one of the quadrants. And so for high impact, high probability risk, we have personal injury, health related risk, introduction of invasive plant life to gardens, unauthorized use of equipment, um, pesticide poisoning, weather and catastrophe, and you can see um, the other things I have listed here. So I'll go through some of these. So personal injury, health related, of course, we're all dealing with senior citizens for the most part, uh, our master gardener group. And so the potential for injury working in the gardens is great. So heat stroke and age related health problems. And this is for your, both your stakeholders. Um, your stakeholders would be your volunteers, the university, the county, and residents. And this could result in fatality. So there's a wide range of physical loss or injury, and there could be injury to reputation. So imagine that I know that it's, you know, we have a heat index of 110, and I have those master gardeners working in the heat of the day. That would not go down well in the media. 
So um, what we do for risk treatment and control, provide source of water for hydration, and emergency contact for all master gardeners, and no medical information about them. So what allergies do they have? Um, do they have any special health issues or concern? And we have first aid kits that are in the office and also out in our propagation um, slash demonstration garden area. And we know who amongst us are CPR certified or who are nurses or physicians. So for this is modification and acceptance of the risk. Then there's a possibility of unauthorized use of equipment. And so in the Master Gardener program, we use a lot of tools and equipment and we have different vehicles that the Master Gardeners use regularly. So there's a possibility of injury, damage to the equipment and fatality. So we have training for them to dr um, drive the county vehicles. We also have a gator that the master gardener owns. And so in order for you, for you to use that gator, you have to go through a training, um, a training session that is taught by one of the master gardeners. And then we have the keys in a locked area. So you have to go see the office manager to get those keys. So she checks to make sure you're on that list. Um, and then we also have training to use the shredder. So increased training, supervision, lockup items when not in use. And for this is avoidance and modification. And then, of course, introduction of invasive plants and insects. So for us in Florida, invasive species are a major problem. And so we operate, um, we operate a propagation area, which is like just go, when you see, if you see our propagation area, it's like going to a local nursery. And so there's always the chance of, you know, master gardener bringing in invasive species or just, you know, winds or bird, wind or bird droppings, whatever, causing us to have introduction of invasive species. So if we have, um, we have a problem with invasive, then the Florida Department of Plant Industry could possibly um, quarantine, our, quarantine our nursery. Um, so educating the master gardeners of invasive plants is important and constant monitoring of our facilities. So we're always monitoring to make sure that we don't have any invasive species and the plants that the master gardeners might be growing at home and donating to us that they're not on the invasive species list. So acceptance and modification there. And then of course, there are the constant vagaries of weather and we have fire, um, hurricane, um, damage from freeze, um, those are all things of concern with regards to weather. And, you know, we, have, we can have potential loss of our, um, of our assets, um, both physical and financial. And we need to make sure that our buildings are installed according to code. We have um, three um, storage shed, we have a greenhouse, we had a shade area. So we have to make sure that all these things are installed according to code and have an emergency preparedness plan. And we constantly evaluate our buildings for soundness. And the county is now handling our um, insurance policy. So a few years ago, what we did, we, had, we were holding money in reserve in our account and we call that like our security blanket so that if something comes through and destroys all our assets we have that money um, that we can go and just you know replace and start up however the county has agreed to um to insure all our assets and so we don't have to worry about that anymore so then it becomes shared and modification and acceptance. Then of course, pesticide poisoning. So um, master gardeners here do use pesticides. And so improper labeling could be a, pro a possible problem. Um, they know that they're supposed to keep things in original containers, but you never know 
um, what can happen. Um, so here, here um, we made sure that we have all the um, safety data sheets together and we also install an iWAS I station in the work area and avoidance and modification there. So what are the barriers to you implementing a risk management plan? And as I said, when I started, you know, people get terrified when you talk about risk. And so change can be a challenge because once you put together a risk management plan, then you're going to need to implement some changes based on the strategies you, you think you need to implement to, to mitigate those risks. So getting feedback from the master gardeners, which I did at the beginning, is important. So they get some buy-in in the process. And that helped with the implementation of the project because they were involved in the beginning. So here are some changes that we made as a result of the risk management plan. So we have a person in charge of equipment maintenance and he does a fabulous job at it. Um, and we have our tool sheds, they're you know, well organized and he has everything numbered. And when we saw how he organized that shed the first time, we were terrified about going in there because it was so well organized, but he had instructions as to what to do to put the tools back and everything. So, um, you know, he does a fabulous job at our equipment maintenance. Um, before the master gardeners used to just come in and work in the gardens. And so, since we put the risk management plan in place, we have a sign in and a sign out sheet so that we know who's here on the compound working. And we also ask that they not be here working by themselves if at all possible. So most times um, there's not any one master gardener out there working. Um, we do regular inspection of our work areas. And so, um, they know here are the things that you need to look for in your areas and especially if we're going to be hosting an event they know they, they need to go around and look for things that could you know there might be a dip in the um in the soil somewhere and our facility is used by lots of different stakeholders and they change around things um in in the area where we host events so we have to make sure or that you know the area is level you know things like that when we are having events now what we've asked the master gardener directors to do um, every few months if you are the chair of propagation then you know every few months you may have someone the chair of the demonstration gardens or someone who doesn't regularly work in the demo in in propagation come and walk through and you know see what is there in propagation that might possibly be a risk because you're working in the area all the time and so things that may not pop out at you may pop out at somebody else and i'm always looking for things also but having a lot of eyes looking as I mentioned before, we implemented a new money counting policy. So whenever we have plant sales, we have multiple people counting the money after at the end of the sale. So they do it right there on site. Um, for our spring festival, where we have um, about 8,000 or more people coming in that two-day weekend, once we collect that money, we have it in a lockbox. And then we lock it away in a secure room for the weekend. And then um, on the Monday, we have a team of master gardeners who come in and count that money. So that's how we're handling our funds. Once we did the walkthrough with the, um, with the county risk manager, he noticed that we had a refrigerator that had both seeds and and our drinks and maybe like um you know um snacks like um granola bars 
And so he said, well, I would like you all to have two separate refrigerators, one for food and one for your seeds or whatever else, you know, non-food item that you want to store in there. So we implemented that. We also provide water and Gatorade for the master gardeners year round. So once they're here on site working, they don't really have to bring anything to drink. A lot of them do, but they don't really have to bring anything to drink if they're feeling thirsty or a bit dehydrated. We have, um, we have um, water or Gatorade for them to use. We had, a, we had an eye station here on, on, on the compound, but the county risk manager felt that it was too far away from where the master gardeners do most of their work, from the propagation and demonstration gardens area. So we installed a new eye wash station much closer to where they work. So um, that was a good thing. Now, in our storage shed, sheds, we didn't have any lighting in any of the sheds. And, and so we were just, you know, using the natural light that comes through the door. However, some of the sheds have, um, have an upper, like not attic, but an upper layer that you have to go into. And you have to use a ladder to go up there. And so we added lighting um, to the storage shed so that it's easier for them to see. And the chances of someone slipping and falling from the ladder would be less. Um, procedure for acceptance and rejection of new applicants. And so as we went through you know, the things that we do, we, we recall that we had someone that we didn't accept into the program and that person went to the county commissioner to report us to say that they applied and we didn't accept them into the program so what we did was that we came up with a scoring rubric for when we do interviews so for each of the questions we have you know we have a system for rating the master gardener i mean the applicants and we give them a score out of a hundred to determine if they'll get into the program and then modification of the university of florida volunteer record of service form so we had a master gardener who fell one day and broke her ankle and luckily her husband is also a master gardener and so he was right there you know we could quickly get him but then as we were going through the focus group session, we realized, you know, hey, we need to modify this form to add the next of kin or the person to contact if the master gardener, if a master gardener ever gets injured or what allergies or what they're allergic to, um, things or health related issues they may have that might be of concern if something happens to them while they're here. So those are the major changes that we've implemented. So in conclusion, the Master Gardeners um, program here in Marion County, we didn't have an initial risk management plan. And most of the risks that we discovered that we had, um, they were an easy fix and they were manageable financially. And so this brought our attention to the subject of risk management, and it's something that is continually being addressed by our board and by our membership. So a risk management plan creates a safe working environment, not only for the volunteers and staff who are here on site, but for the public who comes in and visit us. And um, it reduces the liability for the nonprofit and for the University of Florida and Marion County Board of County Commissioners. So my recommendation to each of you is to assemble a team of stakeholders, your volunteers, staff, and you know anyone else you think might be relevant to the process, and list all your activities and the risk associated with those activities. Um, keep your stakeholders updated on the progress of your plan to ensure easy implementation. Um, that's critical. And as I said before, it was a good thing I had informed 
um, my district director that I was doing this plan because I really didn't expect the feedback that I got from university risk management. They were terrified. Um, once I was done with my plan, I couldn't just implement implement things. So I had to get my, my um, county extension director to read it and approve it. And also um, my, my district extension director and IFAS administration wanted to see the document before it was, you know, it was put out to the Master Gardener Board and the membership. So I had to get approval at all of those levels. So risk management is not a bad term, but an essential tool for program success. So here I have some references and resources that are great um, for you to utilize. And um, I just want to acknowledge my nonprofit risk management professor, um, Dr. Mutasami Kumaran, and that should be 2011 class notes, actually. And um, Garnet, Sabrine, and Mike were the team members working with me on the project. So any questions? Hey, Norma, this is Nicole. Hey. Hi, I'm wondering, um, do you share this during your Master Gardener training, or is this a plan that's sort of an overarching plan for your program and you implement it when necessary? Um, it's a plan that we, we, we um, share as we go along in each, um, in each area. So propagation, they know, here's what you need to be looking out for. Um, same thing in the demonstration garden. So it's something that we keep at the forefront. All right, and we have a couple questions in the chat box. So the first one is from Susan, and Susan's asking, how do you think you can apply these risk management practices over a statewide program? Ah, so I think, I think from the statewide level, um, the state would want to look at what activities that are done at the state level and then put together a risk management plan for those specific activities. Um, I know for 4-H um, here in Florida, they have, a, they have a risk management tool that they ask, you know, whenever people are doing activities for 4-H, here is the, you know, you need to come up with a risk management plan for that specific activity before you undertake that activity. So how we've done it for my program is that we've already, you know, looked at it for all the activities that we currently do. So if we, if we look to implement any new activity, we have to make sure we add a, you know, we, we do a risk assessment for that activity. That's really good advice, um, doing the risk assessment beforehand. Another question that's in the chat box is uh, from Kay Miller, and she, that person's asking, do any of the projects take place off county property at third party locations? That's a good question. Yes, our speakers bureau events um, take place on third party properties. And then we have master gardeners who um, go out and do yard evaluations for the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. So the master gardeners who are going out and doing yard evaluations, they know, for example, well, you're not going out to do that yard assessment by yourself. So it's two or more master gardeners are doing that. Um, they also know that, you know, not to be going out and doing it in the heat of the day, but in the cooler parts of the day. And then of course, if they, they're using county vehicles to go out and do that. So they've taken the county um, defensive driver training um, to mitigate that risk of them getting in an accident. They know what the county's guidelines and policies are and you know, know what the county expects from them for their driving practices. So those are just some examples.
I was going to mention here in my county, some of the things that we did um, are similar to what you've talked about, where uh, we changed the emergency contact information. Our form didn't ask for that, so we're asking now for next of kin and emergency contacts so we can reach them in an emergency. We also reduced the time of our garden work days because it gets very hot here. So instead of it being, you know, let's say from 8 till noon, we've made it, you know, two hours so that people aren't overworked or don't feel burdened to stay here and continue working when they may not be comfortable doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and another thing we did that was kind of interesting is, you know, I saw on your PowerPoint presentation, you talked about um, computer um, concerns. And so we integrated, we linked up with our IT person and actually did a computer literacy class for Master Gardener volunteers. Mm -hmm. So even though it wasn't horticulture based, it helped them to understand, you know, how do you protect your personal and private information? Um, and then also how do you um, implement good computer literacy skills when you're working here um, as an extension volunteer? So that would be maybe a risk assessment area that I would encourage some other counties or states to take a look at and see if you can team up with an IT person to deliver that training for you. Now, what we do here in, in Marion County is that uh, we have a, compute, a county computer policy um, training as part of the new um, Master Gardener training class. So they're using the county computers in the plant clinic. And so they go through all the guidelines for using county computers and you know issues that might be of concern. And whenever they're talking with the general public using email, using their county, um, their county email, because they're each given a county email and not their personal email, because then if they're using personal email, then, it, you know, it becomes exposed to sunshine laws, things like that. Mm -hmm. And something else, uh, Norma and everyone else on the call that's come to mind is that there's always risks associated with social media. And so that was, might be another area that Master Gardener programs need to take a look at, you know, how do we mitigate risk? How do we stay credible? How do we handle conflicting points of views and free speech, all of that on social media? No, for us, um, we have a very active Master Gardener Facebook page. And so the Master Gardener who handles our um, Facebook page, she knows that the information that she puts out there should be information that's, um, that's research based and from a land grant university. If she gets a question that, you know, might be controversial, let's say GMO related, for example, she will send and ask me for, you know, an answer to that question instead of, you know, coming up with the response herself. Um, we also have the county's um, public information officer as an administrator to the page. And so they look at that page constantly. And so if they see something that's of concern, like foul language, you know, they'll pull that information. So the page is being monitored but the bulk of the work is being done as by a master gardener who spends on average seven hours a week working on that page. Are there any other questions um, from the group? You could either unmute your phone and ask a question or type it in the chat box. Okay, well, I don't see any additional questions. Norma, thank you so much. You've given me some things to think about and um, that might be a great plan to start working on a risk management program for next year uh, for my county. So I appreciate you sharing some of your information and um, the challenges and then some of the strategies that you use. So thank you. You're very welcome. It has been a pleasure. Thank you, everyone. All right, thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.